We're talking about bee reed. That's the Blackstone reed. But I feel like this fund is now standing on the edge of a cliff at a precipice, right? Not through mismanagement, the opposite, right? Through their success, they are in fact a victim of their own success. And how does that happen? Well, embedded in this fund is a lot of leverage and they have raised a tremendous amount of assets and they own about $120 billion worth of real estate. And they've had so much success and so many assets coming in that they've been buying all along the way and all along at the top. Welcome to the Investorama podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Phil Back, the CEO of Armada ETFs. Phil's been innovating in the ETF industry for 15 years with numerous roles as CEO, CIO, or managing director at the New York Stock Exchange. And Armada is specializing in REIT ETFs, and that's something that I want to go on a deep dive together with Phil. Phil, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thank you, George. Great to be on. I mentioned you're the CEO of uh, Armada, but um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what got you to where you're today? Yeah, you know, I have a background in, in product and capital markets and, you know, really spent a long time working on developing ETFs. I spent several years at the New York Stock Exchange working on ETF market structure issues and, you know, working with regulators and market makers and ETF issuers on new product innovations. Mm -hmm. And then fortunately for me, <laughs> I got the entrepreneurial bug. And, um, you know, I've been, I've been for the last several years doing a couple different startups, probably most well known for one called Exponential ETFs, where we did ETF uh, products and sub advisory, sold the company to Title Financial Group. And about a year and a half ago, I started looking at REITs through a friend of mine named Justin Goldberg, who runs a real estate property management development company called Navarino in here in the States and in, in, based in Connecticut, but all over the States, he has properties. And, you know, I started looking deeper and deeper into the REIT market and, it, you know, really found some, some very interesting things that I thought nobody was talking about. Nobody was talking about. And, you know, and specifically the definition of what a REIT is, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it had been expanding and things that were that you and I would not consider real estate started to be included in the category of REITs. And what that means is that investors who are in traditional REIT funds, especially index based market cap weighted funds are you know getting exposure to things that they don't really know that they're getting exposure to that they might not really want and then the other interesting thing in REITs is you've got this massive pool and this growing pool of assets in what's called private REIT funds that we'll talk about as well and there are a number of big big systemic risks embedded in those funds that we'll talk about as well so you know I started looking at the space and said wow you know the the vast majority of these assets are in these two big asset pools that are both very, very flawed. I think we can do better for investors. I think investors aren't aware of these risks. And I think we can provide funds that are going to make more sense and be better for them. So I've been at it for uh, about a year now. We have one ETF in the market. We're planning a couple more interesting things. We've got some AI technology that we've onboarded through another company um, that we'll be launching later this year. We have another fund that we're doing later this year. So a lot of very exciting things. Uh, and that's uh, that's where, where we are. Perfect with what we want to talk about, with what this podcast is about, which is about, you know, empowering investors, large and small, sophisticated or not yet sophisticated to really understand what's going on, where are the opportunities and how those products work. And we mentioned B-rate and it's something that I think is that the forefront of this uh, democratization of alts, etc. And definitely I want to talk about it. But I also want to start with the basics, uh, which is to kind of understand real estate, which is the largest asset class, and one, as you say, that touches all of us, and that, but that we don't always, at least as individuals, don't always approach as investors, right? If I buy a home for my family, it's slightly different. And as a little foray to this, I'd like to share a little clip. Which... Land doesn't mean anything to you. Why, land is the only thing in the world worth working for, worth fighting for, worth dying for. Because it's the only thing that lasts. Oh, you talk like an Irish. It's proud I am that I'm Irish. And don't you be forgetting, Missy, that you're half Irish too. And to anyone with a drop of Irish blood in them, why the land they live on is like their mother. Oh, but there, there. No, you're just a child. It'll come to you. This love of the land. There's no getting away from it if you're Irish. It's the love of the land. There's nothing else that matter. So just to get back to basics, one thing I can do is buy a house. Let's say I have a one million, I've got, I, I can buy, let's say, a house, flat, whatever. It comes with multiple costs, but um, I think people understand how it works. So now, uh, so that's direct ownership. Now, can we understand a bit more about yeah, what REITs are? 
Yeah, and you know, I, I love that clip. I mean, you know, the idea that that you know people want to own a piece of land and own properties is, you know, that's been the definition of wealth for the vast majority of, of human existence. Right? Have your property, your farm, and there's something very real and tangible about it. And the more our assets are becoming financialized, it's you know, I think there's like a, a pushback. There's like a swing back, right? It, it kind of boomerangs back and comes back to. You know, people always want hard assets. It's something like embedded in our DNA. And, you know, whether to, you know, some people that means different things. Some people that might mean, you know, gold or, you know, people, you might even put Bitcoin, even though it's not, you know, it is very much in the cloud. But it's still, there's something that you're owning, a part of the digital, you know, digital world that is yours. It's tangible. I think when people think about something tangible and real, real estate is the first thing that comes to mind. Um so, you know, how do you do it, right? You can own your home, but obviously you have, you know, extreme uh, lack of diversification, right? So you're in your specific geography, God forbid you have a house or a fire or a flood or, or whatever issue that you have. It'd be nice to be able to do it in a more diversified way. And that's, what, that's, that's where REITs come in. It's a very efficient vehicle to be able to access a broader set of real estate. And what it is, a REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. Right? And it's a company that owns or operates, or in some cases now finances, income-producing properties. And it's, you know, the income-producing is a big part of it because to qualify as a REIT, you get special tax treatments, but you have to pass through a lot of that income in the form of dividends. So it's a, you know, it's a very nice product because you get the, the income stream from the dividends and the capital appreciation of the price of the REITs you know, going up or down. They can be publicly traded or not. And that's a big distinction that we'll get into when we talk about BREIT. The publicly traded REITs are, you know, like any other stock, they're traded on the exchange and they're marked to markets. Every day, the value of the REIT is what is someone willing to pay for it today with a cash bid? What is someone actually willing to pay for it, right? So it gets moved around like all stocks do. And there's a little bit of volatility there day to day. But at the end of the day, you know that the price is a real price. It's a liquid price that you can sell at. Private REITs That's don't have that. Private REITs. You have an appraisals-based NAV, and, um, and and we'll get more into that in a little bit. But you don't have the same mark-to-market. You don't have the same volatility. And it's kind of like you know looking at public companies versus private equity, where the volatility is a lot smoother because it's not mark-to-market. And there's you know something called the smoothing effect and you know what Cliff Asness calls volatility laundering, all these reasons why the volatility appears to be lower on the private side than it is on the public side. But ultimately, a property is a property regardless of how it trades. One thing that I'd like to uh, emphasize on is this bit about the um, passing on the income and, and equity with special rules. Because when I hear about a company that invests in property, I think to myself, well, there will be a lot of equity risk. This, there's the management, and I don't know what they're going to do. Maybe they reinvest all the, um, all the rent into something else. It's their right to do so. So if I understand what you're saying, REITs uh, mitigate that, let's say, equity risk or it's a bit like investing directly in property. That's exactly right. REITs sit in between stocks and bonds. So you have the dividend stream, you have the income, and you have the capital appreciation. So it's not quite a bond where it's only the, the dividend stream. It's not quite an equity where there is, you know, I mean, obviously there are degrees of both, but that's where REITs sit. And like I said, ultimately REIT is a tax treatment. You know, it, it's a real estate. The RE in REIT stands for real estate. However, the definition of what is real estate has been expanding as more and more types of companies try to take advantage of the benefits of the REIT, of the tax structure. So what you get now is you have uh, data centers, our big category of REITs, uh, cell towers are REITs, you know, anything from student housing, senior housing facilities, hospitals, all sorts of different products are now categories as REITs. And that's great if that's what you're looking for. But what I want to warn investors is that a REIT is not a REIT. Just because it says it's a REIT doesn't mean that you're getting real estate. Now, if you don't want, if you want to be in a cell tower, and there are plenty of reasons why you might want that, no problem, right? But if you think that you're buying real estate and you buy a REIT fund, and then you come to find out that actually you're more correlated in about 30 to 40% of your portfolio, you're more correlated to tech stocks than you are to real estate. Well, if that's, again, if that's your intention, if that's the exposure that you think you're getting and that you want, then there's no problem. But if, you, if that's not the exposure that you want, or if you're now doubled up on exposure that you didn't realize you were, because you also have your, you know, high tech allocation, then that can be problematic. So I would encourage investors to, you know, look at what they're buying and 
you know, understand that a REIT is not a REIT and not yeah, everything is. Even if it's RE, it's not necessarily real estate in the way we understand it. Right. That's right. Something definitely to bear in mind. And then, so we can invest directly into specific REITs. We can invest in funds that invest in REITs. Those funds can be public and private or many, I think, are broad indices. And then there's passive and active, right? Is that kind of the, a good landscape of the possibilities mm -hmm. that are offered? So I'd like to understand a little bit more details of one REIT ETF. So if we take, for example, the house ETF by Armada, can you get us through the details of how it's built, its components, and then as well the rationale behind it? I might be a little biased. This is our ETF. Yes, right? yes. It's not about promoting one specific ETF. It's about understanding how it's built. But uh, you can absolutely tell us, uh, you know, all the good things no, about of course, it. Of course. I, you know, I would ask... Um, the audience take what I say with a degree of skepticism, do your own research and double check things. And, you know, Absolutely. this is not financial advice, listen to your own financial advisor, all those disclaimers. Really, what we wanted to do was very simple. We wanted to provide a pure play on residential REITs. And, you know, the reason why it really started, like I said, I, I became introduced to REITs through this product. My partner, Justin Goldberg, is in the real estate space. And we're looking at the macro environment. And, of course, you know, as everyone knows, there are reasons to be uh, worried about with rising rates, worried about real estate, worried about di different categories. And well, you know, real estate, you know, like we talked about, real estate is a tangible, it's a hard asset in an, in a, an inflationary environment, even in a stagflation environment, real estate should hold its value as a hard asset. But where within REITs, where do you want to be? The correlations between the different subsectors of REITs are very low, meaning that they trade differently than themselves. There are different economies within the REIT world. So where within REITs would you want to be in a more difficult market environment. And for us, that answer is very clearly in the residential space, because remember, the residential REITs are, are generating their income through rents paid, right? And while home prices are extremely volatile, especially in down markets, rental incomes can be a little bit volatile, but they're a lot more stable than home prices. If you look back to global financial crisis, Rentals did decline a little bit. They declined, I think, like 5% or so. They, they were fairly stable while home prices crashed like 40%, right? So you get the stability, you get the benefits from the, an inflationary environment. And then if you look at the demographic trends in the U.S. and you look at the supply-demand imbalance and you look at the occupancy rates of residentials of these apartment units and all that, they're phenomenal. They're really good. So we think it's a very stable place to be. It's a very good place to be. And, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about the broad REIT, you know, the market cap weighted and the broad REIT funds that, that hold anything that's REITs. Well, you know, again, they've got a lot of assets that are highly correlated to technology, not to real estate, right, through the cell towers and the data centers. And that, that again, that could be great, but they have run up to, uh, you know, almost uh, you know, logic defying valuations. So I think there's a little bit of risk there. And then they hold a lot of assets like office buildings, I don't know about you, but I'm not, I mean, you can see we're doing this. We're not in an office, right? I'm at home. Um, I think a lot of people are, you know, maybe trickling back to the office a couple of days a week, at least in my circle, the people that I see, I would not want to own an office building right now, you know, until, until we know what the effects post COVID are going to be long-term on, on people working at home versus not. So there's a lot of risk there. There's a lot of assets. You know, you look at uh, Jim Chanos has been, you know, very vocal about, you know, being short um the data centers and i think he has a very very convincing thesis on why so there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about different pockets of the REIT market but we felt like the residential REIT is is quite good right now the valuations are good the demographics are good there's a lot of reasons to be bullish so we wanted to provide a pure play exposure on just the residentials right just the good stuff and, in and so in Yep. And in practical terms, so that means what are you investing in? What is the fund investing in? So the... it's all U.S. publicly traded REITs that are residential only. So we're talking about multifamily housing. We're talking about apartment complexes, you know, real homes, tangible assets that people live in, that people pay rent in. We are actively managed. So we have a, an overlay. You know, it's not a high churn active strategy. It's more of a risk mitigation strategy. We know these REITs. Our portfolio manager has been in the REIT industry for 20 years. He's managed billions of dollars of REIT funds. Like we, we have relationships directly with a lot of the REIT companies and CEOs. We, you know, we view the active component of this as more of a risk management, you know, overlay where we can, you know, if we see any warning signs or if we see anything we don't like in the financials, then we can avoid it. It's not really to try to capture alpha. It's more to try to make sure that we are 
keeping people in the right safe streets that, that we think are, you know, giving you pure exposure to this asset class, to the residential sector of the REIT market, and then uh, the diversification benefits of being able to get the entire category in one trade. Perfect. And I think this demystification of what a REIT is actually is, is very important. And that opens the possibilities. And I'm putting myself in an individual shoe, but I think it's for everyone, every investors, right? Of how, how do you use that as a strategy? And there's two things that I have in mind. A, in a broader portfolio of, you know, equity, bonds, blah, blah, blah. And B, most important investment decision that most of us are going to do in their life is buy a house. But let's first start with how do you see that in broad asset diversification in a global portfolio? I think a lot of investors are over allocated to their personal house and should probably not invest. For, for those investors, I would not recommend buying our ETF. In fact, I would say you might want to hedge right, your exposure to real estate. You might be over allocated. But when you buy a home, you're highly, highly concentrated, of course, in your, you know, your local geography, in your local neighborhood, in your house itself. So if you have you know, like I said earlier, a flood or a fire that's not insured or something, you know, th there's, there are risks that can be diversified away by owning, you know, like our, our REITs, each of the individual REITs, and then the fund of REITs, you're going to be spread out, you know, geographically across, this is a U.S. focused fund, but across the U.S. and property type. But, um, you know, I, th I think investors do need to be uh, aware of their concentration and their personal accounts to real estate. So if you're you know, if your home equity is half your net worth, probably not the wisest thing to go and put half of your, you know, investment portfolio also in REITs. But if you have a reasonable allocation and then you want to diversify your real estate holdings from what you have personally to something more broad and more diversified, then I think it's a good strategy. For more institutional okay. investors, they don't have that same problem. Basically, if you're a family office or a hedge fund, like you're not, you know, worried about your personal home being half your net worth. And then it, it goes the other way. It's like, all right, well, how do we catch up to what we think is a, you know, historically a better performing asset class, more stable asset class, typically historically, not always, but, you know, for the most part. Um, so how do, how do you get that exposure and REITs offer a very elegant way to do so? Yeah. And I just think you uh, out loud, I'm cautious about property, but, you know, I'm also not very bullish on anything else. So income, rents uh, is just an idea that I like very superficially. But there's also a second thing that I'm trying to think of in terms of uh, how do you manage this life changing decision of buying a house or, you know, switching from one house to another. And for someone who, well, I don't have other house, I would think that perhaps it's a good idea to have your assets indexed on the price of houses. For example, if you're saving for a house. Uh, that's a great idea, right? So if you're, if you're saving your nest egg and then from the time, let's say you start saving today over five years to put away money. So five years from now, you'll have a down payment. And then in that time, real estate prices skyrocket, you're going to be behind schedule. So if you take that money and invest it in the residential real estate sector, it'll be hedged. So housing prices go up, you'll you know benefit from that appreciation. And then by the way, if your investment in the REITs goes down, it's very unfortunate, but you're, you're still hedged because then you're buying your house in five years at the lower price. So it gives you a little more security. You know, I think a lot of people, uh, I know a lot of people personally that over the last few years had been saving or planning to buy and have now gotten priced out. So it, that is a very good way to, to hedge that risk. Yeah, no, it seems obvious to me. It's something that many people don't do. But uh, in fact, you know, whoever saves money, typically invest, invest for down payment, will put in uh, equities and stocks and uh, the family event, right? I know for me, it's about oh, having a second kid. Wow, we need to move house. And uh, it makes perfect sense uh, to be somehow hedged. Uh, then having uh, equities and, and bonds that may go up or may go down, but are not correlated. So yeah. it's, it's quite an interesting way of thinking of, of REITs as well, I think. Um, and a tool for home buyers. We've seen, you know, how they work. We've understood more about real estate in general and how to figure it out as an investment. And I very much appreciate as well how you remind us that we often over invested as individuals and perhaps under invested as an institutional level. Uh, one of the things that we talk about that I think is so important is this advent of BREIT. And it's a massive fund and why is it so important to me it's not so much about the fact that well it is a big fund 70 billion but it's also uh, the vanguard of what something that's very important for this podcast for these listeners 
this democratization of alternatives, the fact that now everything's becoming accessible and that the big funds like Blackstone in this case are coming for perhaps not retail investors, but anyway, individual investors, right? And they are in this case, retail. Yep. Yes, this opportunity comes at a time when interest rates are rising, when things are changing, when the performance has been fantastic in during yep. the whole period when yep. interest rates were so low. And now we say, hey, look, you, you can buy this today. So that's kind of to set up the scene. I've taken a few notes from Brit. I'll do the quick pitch from BRIT and you can tell me what you think about it. So uh, it says 14.7% free year annualized, steady distribution, expertise from Blackstone, less volatility, bullet points, but that's kind of like the BRIT pitch. Can you tell us a bit what, what might be going wrong with that or how we should look at it? Yeah, it's really fascinating. So it is a great fund. So we're talking about B-REIT. It's the Blackstone REIT, uh, which is a private fund of non-traded REITs. So private So REITs, you know, people mostly think of them as publicly traded. They're companies, essentially, that trade on the exchange. And that means that you get a, a, a mark-to-market, you get price discovery happens in real time. Someone's willing to buy it. Someone's willing to sell it. They trade. That's your last price. And then you have that every day. This fund is really a great fund. I mean, they did a great job. Blackstone B-REIT. Let's also talk about the Starwood S-REIT, right? And there's a KKR version. A lot of private equity funds that are doing the same thing. But we'll talk about B-REIT because B-REIT has been by far the most successful in gathering assets, in, in gathering mind share and market share. So when, when I say B-REIT, consider a B-REIT comma at all, right? B-REIT and the category. For me, it's about B-REIT and all the private assets, right? Where it's private debt, private... But B-REIT is kind of a good... Good example. So, so Blackstone has done a very good job. We, like I said, we know these properties. We know the different. Re- we think they've done a very good job at selecting properties and managing properties. The performance of this fund has been great. And where we stand today is kind of interesting, I feel. And this is my opinion, but I feel like this fund is now standing on, on, on the edge of a cliff at a precipice. Right. And through not through. Um, mismanagement, the opposite, right? Through their success, they are, in fact, a victim of their own success. And how does that happen? How did that work? Well, embedded in this fund is a lot of leverage, and they have raised a tremendous amount of assets, $68 billion, right? And they own about $120 billion worth of real estate. And they've had so much success and so many assets coming in that they've been buying all along the way and all along at the top. And, you know, while interest rates were, you know, artificially suppressed, really buying at not only peak valuations, but peak, you know, low financing costs and, and everything else. And the market turned very, very quickly, right? With the rising rates and inflation and, and everything else, commercial real estate market especially really froze up and liquidity kind of disappeared. And a lot of the success that Blackstone had, a lot of the assets that had come in, so according to them, it came in through Asia and different institutions and, and the redemptions came very suddenly, more suddenly than they expected, the redemption requests at least. So again, they had been raising capital and they had inflows coming into the fund. And if you have redemptions, so people trying to get out of the fund and people trying to get in, great, you can offset the two, right? No big deal. What happened here was all at once you had the redemption requests, you had inflows or new people coming into the fund drying up because people are now concerned about the market and concerned about real estate. And they didn't have enough inflows to offset the redemptions. Um, They own a lot of commercial CMBS and different liquid vehicles that they can use to provide liquidity, but they didn't have enough. And what you do in that situation, if you're them, it's no big deal. So this isn't like an FTX situation, like they own the properties, they just sell the properties. And then they can use the cash to give people their money back. But they found what everyone in the commercial real estate market knows, which is that liquidity is almost non-existent now with financing costs all of a sudden so high. So they've been unable to meet liquidity demands for a while now. And, you know, they gated the fund, which means that you can't get your money out. You can get out now 5% a quarter maximum. Every time you put in a redemption request, they fill a little bit. You got to resubmit every month, resubmit, resubmit to try to get your money out. They incentivize University of California to invest $4 billion, $4.5 billion, I think, in, uh, in this fund. They gave them a preferential waterfall return stream. I mean, it's, it's outrageous and that might work for a little bit, but what happens next quarter? So. Yeah. I just want to stop, pause, pause on this one because it's something that seems quite extraordinary, but they pulled them, they, they pulled this deal out of the hat because I guess they're Blackstone. So they can, you know, call all the pension funds and say, Hey, look, we've got a deal for you. But 
this is quite something. This has not been fully covered by the media, whereas the Alt of Redemption started really bubbling up, right? And certainly there's been this deal, but I don't know. It, it seems extraordinary to me. Do I, do I get it wrong? Is this something that people do give preferential treatment to one investor? It is extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And if you're in the fund, it is extraordinary. And if you're a retail investor in this fund, your money's locked up and you don't have the preferential treatment. I would be I wouldn't be very happy with Blackstone. You're telling me that I can't get my money out and you're you're incentivizing new people to come in with better with a better deal than I get? Like that that doesn't seem you know, you talk about this fund is democratizing, you know, access to, to real estate. That doesn't sound very democratic to me at all. But that's yeah, not no, even I the agree, biggest I agree. issue here. Mm -hmm. The biggest issue, I mean, you got you got high fees in this fund, now you have no liquidity. You used to have low liquidity, now you've got, you know, real liquidity concerns. But the biggest issue here is that the way that, so I talked about how publicly REITs are traded on the exchange and you have price discovery happens every day, what's someone willing to buy it at, what's someone willing to selling at, sell it at, they're fairly liquid, you know, they're very clear what these things are worth. The way a fund like BREIT works with the non-traded REITs is they use appraisers to come in and tell them what each value is worth. And the appraisers come in, you know, and revalue the properties maybe once a year, depending on the fund, you know, sometimes a little more frequent, but you know, not, not terribly frequent. And appraisers are humans they themselves have a bias, and this has been proven, they have a bias away from volatility. So whatever I, I marked it at last year, that's kind of my baseline. I'm not going to give it a wildly different valuation this year, typically, right? I'll be more anchored to my historical valuation than I would in the public markets that just don't care. They're saying, hey, you know, S&P's down, rates are up, we're just going to make our markets wherever our models tell us to. So the publicly traded REITs have gone down 20% over the last year, and these private REITs are up. They're up according to the appraisers, according to what Blackstone is putting out. Now, the incentives here, right? Now, this isn't Blackstone just saying, hey, we're going to mark this thing wherever we want. They have a, an appraisal process, and I think their appraisers are very good, and they're sophisticated in their approach. However, it is important to note conflicts of interest and incentive structures. I mean, you have to, you know, I'm not saying that these are driving the valuations entirely, but they could have some impact on it. And Blackstone is collecting a fee, 125 basis points on the NAV. The higher the NAV, the higher the fee. But if you put the fee too high, say, okay, great, you're mispriced it too high. I sell, right? No big deal. I can sell and capture that gain. But you can't sell. You cannot sell. You're gated. You're stuck in. So you can't arbitrage away the higher NAV. You can't short it. There's no liquid way to do that. You can't even sell and get your money out. So a lot of people are collecting dividends, which are getting reinvested at the inflated NAV. So your dividends are kind of fake. They're inflated. Your NAV is fake, but you're paying a fee on a higher number. And we think that there's a 20% delta right now between where these things are being marked on their NAV and where they should be based on public market comps. Now, you can say that, well, Blackstone is so smart. They're really good at managing properties. They are. I think they are, too. I came to the same assessment. I think they're very good at what they do. But are they 20% better? after clearing a 300 basis point annual compounding fee difference between the private REITs and the public REITs, that's simply inhuman. That's simply not possible. There's nobody that can do that. Buffett couldn't do that. There is nobody that could do that. So it's quite, it's quite fun to look at the NAV. I've been just zooming in on the NAV right now. And it's like, it managed to be it's just stable, just stable. Well, which is kind yeah. of almost comical. I mean, this is beautiful. I would love to invest in this too, if it were true, right? You know, a real unfortunate thing here, and one of the things that I've written about is, you know, the more portfolio management is on, on the allocation on the portfolio level is being automated, the more um, securities are being selected based on a client's risk profile and based on the standard deviation of the volatility of the underlying risk assets. Because this chart looks like this, right, because we see almost no volatility historically in BREIT and these private REITs, this fund has been optimized in for investors that are least risk tolerant. And what that means is that widows and orphans and people that think they're in very safe investments, they think they're in treasuries or the, you know, the people that cannot afford the 15 to 20 percent drawdown that we see coming in this fund are the very same investors that are in this fund with no way out. And probably topping up uh, on a regular basis. Now, okay, that's a very clear and very important update, Phil. Thank you very much. There's a couple more things that I want to zoom in in what you said. One is liquidity. And you, you mentioned obviously no liquidity. It's gated. You can, there's I think 5% every month or something like that. 
but there's perhaps a misconception that you know if it's a big fund it's going to be liquid and also that liquidity goes both ways right but uh, you can buy as much as you want perhaps but it doesn't mean you can sell as much as you want and this is true for 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 not just be read but this is kind of a a general private assets thing, right? But can you tell us a little bit about this? Uh, it's something you mentioned as well in your Substack about this size of the fund and liquidity, because I think that's something that I see very often ETF investors in general, uh, perhaps getting confused. Yeah, well, well, that's that. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. This perception that the bigger is more liquid, the bigger the fund is, the more liquid is, and a small fund is illiquid. And that might be true of stocks, of companies, of securities, but it's not true of funds because funds trade off the underlying. So like our, our fund is brand new. It's not, you know, we don't have, we're not big aggressive distribution people. We're not paying fancy, you know, wholesalers to go out and take everyone to lunch. And our fund is small. You know, I've got about 4 million bucks today that we're recording this in the fund. It's small, but it's liquid. If you talk to a market maker, say, how much of this fund can I buy? And they calculate, well, how much of the underlying REITs can they source? They'll tell you that they can make a market of, of t literally $2 billion on a $4 million ETF today without moving the price. Right. So that's liquidity. And we have people for the underlying REITs that we buy. You have market makers that are sitting there on the bid. You have investors that are sitting there on the bid. They're sitting there on the offer every day. When the New York Stock Exchange is open from 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern, every market day, you have liquidity in the underlying REITs, which means liquidity in the ETF. Now, this idea that big funds, because there's so much assets in it, those are liquid is preposterous. Because if you look at every big implosion that we've had, Right. It always follows the same script. It always follows that there's a period of low volatility or some, you know, some false sense of security. Everyone piles in and then everyone's in and there aren't enough lifeboats and nobody can get out. And that's exactly what's happening now in the private read funds. These funds are huge, but they're not liquid. They're not liquid at all. They're gated. He said 5% a month is 5% a quarter is all you can get out. And I don't know how they're going to come up with the cash for even that 5% a quarter. I don't know how many more UC deals they can pull out of the hat. So, you know, unless they can start selling properties at the appraisal based NAVs that they got, which we think are 20% inflated, they're not going to be able to do that. And until they can do that, they're not going to be able to provide full liquidity at NAV on the assets that they have. It's the same thing we've seen also with, uh, you know, a number of funds like GBTC, I think is a good example. Totally different asset class. That's the Bitcoin trust, but it's trading now at like a 50% discount. It's a huge fund, but because it's big, you know, because it's so big, the sponsor knows that if they open up to redemptions, then it's going to, you know, everyone gets their money out. They start selling. It's going to crush the price of Bitcoin, which is going to kill their entire business, all their sister companies and everything. So they can't open it up to redemptions. Everyone is trapped in the fund. The only way to sell is on a secondary market at a 50 percent discount. A big fund is not liquid. A big fund is the opposite. A big fund is liquidity risk. That's so important. So valuation in public markets can be a little bit stupid. It's as if someone knocks at the door of my house every day and say, hey, I buy it for whatever, 1 million today, 500 tomorrow. It can be meaningless, but on the other hand, it's not like you choose to mark the valuation at the price you want. And that's what's happening here. And we've reached this crucial point where, well, it could go very wrong. Um, there's a few more things that I want to talk about, but uh, let's have another little break with a little clip of one of my favorite series, The Sopranos. Buy land, AJ, because God ain't making any more of it. Tony Soprano, TFA. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what, what we're seeing here, and again, there's been this magic trick that they pulled off, and that therefore, Brit is not so much in the news, but it's something that could be very significant. And when you see how liquidity can move, well, let's say from one bank to another, to talk about you know recent events, how people search for for yields, how power assets move quickly, right nowadays, um, this is quite something I think fundamental. And yeah. let's not just talk about B REIT. It's about this whole uh, private assets and private assets suddenly becoming available to broad retail investors. Should we rightfully be worried about the bunch of them? You know, it's very hard to say. Private private assets have done very well for a very long time. There are some reasons, I think, that are justifiable why you could expect a, a return premium, but there are a lot of risks. And, you know, I think when you look back over the last, you know, 30 years of this nonstop, never-ending decline, artificially suppressed, you know, rates, right? And how much of that was a driver in private fund returns where, you know, private equity and venture, but, but mostly private equity is able to, you know, access super low financing costs. 
how much of the returns were a function of that versus a function of their expertise and ability to come in and find undervalued assets and turn them around and, you know, all, all the work that private equity does, which is good work. I don't want to be so dismissive as to say, well, it's all because of rates, but I wouldn't be so foolish as to say none of it is because of rates. And, you know, the question is, well, is this rate hike, right? Is this new environment that we're in? We're only at 5%. I mean, we're not like, you know, obscene Volcker 20% rates. Is this a blip? And are, and are the central bank, I mean, clearly the central bankers have a bias to keep rates low, and that's not going to change. They're going to try and they're going to use any excuse they can to artificially suppress rates. That is very apparent. And whether you disagree with that, as I do or not, is irrelevant. That's what they're going to do. They're going to keep rates artificially low. Now, whether that means that inflation continues to run and they're going to keep it four points under inflation, but inflation goes to 10 percent and we've got 6 percent rates. Right. Or whether that means that inflation gets under control or maybe we even hit a deflationary environment and they bring rates back down in near zero. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you that that the environment that we're in today is very different than the zero interest rate policy environment. And it, it is very clearly having a major impact on private market returns, on their ability to do deals in the future. And if we do not get out of this environment, then it's hard to see how that reverses in the short term. Now, it could be a repricing, you know, because remember, the public markets have already come down since their highs. And not to say that they're done, not to say that they've hit a bottom. I, I don't know. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, but they have at least come down from their highs. But a lot of the private stuff has not. Right. They haven't marked down their own assets yet. And eventually they're going to have to. Right. I mean, they can't hold them up forever. Is this a temporary thing? Is this just kind of a blip and we go back to zero and every or is this a new paradigm? And if it is, in fact, a new paradigm, and I don't know, but if it is, then we're going to see write downs on the private side, not only private REITs, but private equity as a whole that are going to be substantial. Yes, you would agree with my first guest, which Edward Chancellor, who wrote a book on interest rates, the price of time and who. I think demonstrates that low interest rates create uh, bad investment decisions and they're very, very good. They're very helpful for private equity and, and things like that. My broad question about the whole private assets side was a little bit, uh, let's say, provocative or too simple. But I think that's kind of a one key thing that investors need to think about because as the door opens with this new opportunity of private assets, well, the environment is also very different from what it was and so favorable to private asset as it was yesterday. So, you know, not something that we can solve uh, just here and there, but really something that means you need to be um, thoughtful, empowered, do your research, etc. It's been wonderful. As a conclusion, I'd be curious to know a little bit, I don't know if you can talk about it, what's happened with Armada and Ariel Go and the establishment of a technology-guided REIT asset manager. Are you able to share a bit about the plans? Yes. Yeah, so we announced plans to merge. We're, we're going through the process now, the formal legal process, but to merge with uh, an AI machine learning data company that specializes, also specializes in REITs. So, you know, I talked about earlier in the show about how REITs kind of sit in between fixed income and equity. They're more sensitive to interest rates, for example, than equity is. There are certain factors that are a little bit different, and we feel like REITs need to be valued differently than you would value equity, differently than you would value fixed income. And what Arialgo has done is develop these machine learning models that are just incredibly advanced, you know, years ahead of, of anything else we've seen in the market. So, you know, where we are today, a lot of people I talk to, oh, AI is a fad, AI is a fad, you know, Web3 and NFT were fads and all these other fads. Those were, in fact, fads. I don't believe that AI is a fad. I think it's a new paradigm. Now, AI is a category, just like Excel is not a category, right? Microsoft Excel is not a job, nor is it a category, it's a tool. And the first accountants or CFOs that ditched their calculators and, and you know, went on Excel, or I think it was even Lotus before Excel, but those first people, they didn't create a new category, they just became really efficient and good at what they did, right? I see this very similarly. I think being able to take advantage of machine learning and AI in our workflows that are already running today is going to make us smarter and better and more efficient. And to me, if you're an asset manager and you're not incorporating these, these types of models and tools into your process, I think you're going to be left in the dust. We're going to be staying ahead of the curve. Our go-to-market on these models, right, the way we're implementing them is something we're still determining. So whether we're going to launch funds, uh, ETFs with the models, whether we're going to take on sub-advisor mandates or private funds, perhaps even sell signals. So we're working through all that right now. A lot of advantages, pluses and minuses to each. 
Uh, so it's going to be a few months before we're out in the market with this technology. But, you know, the technology itself is unbelievable. We have 25 independent machine learning models specific to REITs that are all running simultaneously, including a couple of the models that are models of models tell us which work in which environments. Some are top down, some are bottom up. It's really remarkable what the team at Ariago has been able to put together. And I'm so excited to be able to incorporate it into our business. Wow, fantastic. Phil, uh, well, we're super excited to follow your entrepreneurial journey, what the new merge company will come up with, but also your writing, your tweets, and uh, well, your podcast when you relaunch it. And we'll put all the links below. Do you want to remind us a little bit uh, where to find you? Uh, ArmadaETFs.com and uh, on Substack is just Phil Bach, B-A-K. Twitter is Phil Bach 1. Uh, <laughs> I don't know who's got Phil Bach, but... Um... You know, when I signed up in haste, that was the handle I took years ago. I had this thing for years and, and didn't say a single word about finance. I was following comedians or whatever random thing. And only a few years ago, I started to get very active. And it is, uh, it's a very addictive platform. I'd caution people against Twitter, but I do have fun on there. So uh, that's probably the best way to catch me. And uh, George, I really appreciate the time. This is a fun conversation. Yeah, it is, uh, there's a great uh, thread on uh, Phil's Twitter about what we discussed. Thank you so much. And, you know, as an ETF guy myself, I'm uh, particularly excited to um, keep following all this. Thank you. George. All the best. Thank you for listening to Investorama, your guide to the future of investing without the hype. Please subscribe to the podcast and rate it on your favorite podcast app.